When I finally hung up my footy boots, having no footy to worry about, meant I could pursue other interests, one of those being architecture. Now, I've been involved in a number of residential projects and smaller commercial builds, so I've come across a number of architects in my time. And let me tell you, from my experience, the very best architects are passionate, they're articulate, they're visionary, and perhaps most importantly, not short of an opinion or two. In this series, Designing Dreams, I meet some of New Zealand's very best architects and visit their favourite Kiwi homes. Big, small, old, new. All sorts of amazing houses all over the country. Along the way, we'll talk about the big housing issues like affordability and sustainability and what the future of the New Zealand house just might be. Plus, I'm always on the lookout for ideas and inspiration for my own projects, so I get the feeling we're going to learn plenty, we'll enjoy ourselves, and we'll get the inside word on what it takes to design dreams. I suppose I'm very blessed that I have probably way too much energy. I get up out of bed at four o'clock in the morning. I do very much enjoy the way the sun rises into the sky in the South Pacific. And what motivates me is, you know, the very simple things like the way the waves hit you when you're standing on the beach. The way the smell of the frangipani can elicit an emotion. You know, you can be inspired by anything in life and how you interpret that into beauty and therefore architecture. And with pragmatism imbued is what we do as a job. But yeah, it's a very privileged role that we have. Michael O'Sullivan is a partner in the Bull O'Sullivan Architectural Practice formed in 1994 and the winner of several major design awards. It's important that these studios make people feel good, relaxed, make people feel like they could be inspired to do something that's probably outside their comfort zone. Every day is different with Michael. It can be quite crazy, but he's very energetic and um, we get to work on some amazing projects. We want to do a level threshold drainage. I think the ideas he comes up with is sometimes very unpredictable, and that's why it's awesome. That's why it's great. You know, like some really um, sophisticated and complex and, like thinking comes out of it. Michael was exposed to architecture early on through his dad, Pat, an Irish immigrant who was a builder and contractor. Even as a youngster, Michael was helping out on site. I mean, everything from you know, loading scaffolding to tying steel to mixing concrete just had a sort of a clarity of thought and a sensibility about him, and it was intoxicating. He and his seven siblings grew up in a house his dad designed and built in Papa Toy Toy. For somebody who had never formally trained as an architect, uh, he got a lot of things right. Michael's going to show me New Zealand houses that have significance for him. Some his own, and some by other architects. Starting with the place he built for his family in Mangari, not far from his childhood home. Oh, g'day, Michael. Matthew. Very nice. nice to meet you. And you. Wow, what an amazing house. Thank you. You're coming off the street, it's really private, isn't it? Like, it is, yep. And this, it's almost like a tent-like form. No one's ever called it a tent. It's yeah, well, I, I, I know. Like, <laughs> like, it's it's an amazing tent. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's good. Loving the uh, the height of the doors. Yeah, you'd have to be a big man to knock your head on that. Yeah. But I, I'm pretty fascinated about the inside. So come on, yeah, on come in? on. Yeah, in. excellent. Wow. Michael built most of the house himself and took quite an experimental approach. There's so many things I want to talk about, and the first thing is the roof. 
It's the first thing that caught my eye. What's the wood? That's a western red cedar. What we did here is get three different board woods, put it up as we felt. There was very few drawings. I was too, too tight to go and buy lights, yeah. so I just made these little triangular sleeves and yeah. got $5 battens from Bunnings. Really unique and a cool design feature. I've never seen a brass kitchen bench. It's pretty amazing. What, what gave you the idea for this? It is a pretty magnificent material, yeah. and uh, when it's polished, it's exceptional, but you can let it patina off and it becomes quite beautiful. But I did spend all last night polishing the top, the front, and the two sides for you specifically. But oh, thank I got, you. <laughs> I got to the back end of it and I gave up. I said, well, oh, you brushed I bet you Matthew won't come in there on the back, <laughs> so you're meant to stand no, on the other side of it. No, that's <laughs> real cool. And this would last forever, right? You, yeah. You'll yep. never have to replace that. Well, if it's good enough for the Catholic Church, I think it's good enough for us. Yeah, absolutely. And there's another standout feature created from spectacular material in the private section of the home. Well, you should probably have a look down here, Matthew. Wow, that's because amazing. Because this is, uh, every home amazing. should have a sanctuary. Wow. And this is the sanctuary. Now, it looks like a green stone. Well, it's a cheap man's version of it. Wow. And it's called Verdi I'm... Ming, and it's a beautiful marble. Isn't it? And um, it's the closest thing that of. Seen to a, a riverbed in the west coast of the South Island. Yeah, it's beautiful, eh? and, and the softness and the, the, the texture is amazing. And the shower is a different colour, so the contrast is, is really cool. The way it all interacts with one another, and it does give you that feeling of serenity and peace and calmness. Yeah. And while it's not a big bathroom, it still feels spacious because of the lights. You know, you got the, the skylight here, the slide here. You've really thought of everything, haven't you? We'll try to, Matthew. Yeah. <laughs> no, mate, genius. Just down the hallway from this extraordinary bathroom is Melissa and Michael's bedroom. Then upstairs, the kids' rooms are located in a shingle-clad pavilion that seems to almost hover in the air and forms a carport below. At 120 square metres, the house is deceptively small but Michael has cleverly incorporated a versatile outdoor living zone as well. I love this house. It's full of surprises. Lots of nooks and crannies, uh, lots of really cool design features. And here's another one, a sauna. Who would have thought? And there are more surprises. I thought that maybe we might sit down for a cuppa. The bottom one there, Matthew. This one here and here? Ah, oh, the bottom one. Oh, yeah, the sun came But it out. turns out Michael and his partner, Melissa, have other plans. A massive feed for us and his mother, Ellen. So, Ellen, what was Michael like as a, as a child? How was he as a, as a young man growing up? And was he, was he a good, good boy? He was. He was very good. He's prone to coughing and cold, but, you know... Yeah. He, after that, you know, he was So he's a little soft. Yes, he was. <laughs> <laughs> that clearly changed because Michael grew up to become a formidable wrestling champion. Plus, I reckon, you've got to be pretty tough to build your own house from scratch. Melissa, what was it like building this place when you had a young family with a husband that hadn't built a house before, but he designed some? <laughs> you must have thought he was... or that you were both mad. <laughs> um, exciting and worrying, I guess you could say. Um, yeah, no, it was a busy time. It was well worth it, though, because the house received a lot of accolades, including Home of the Year, and Michael has gone on to produce many more award-winning designs. So, Ellen, you must be very proud of your son, um, and what he's achieved, in particular in the field of oh, architecture. Absolutely. And I'm sure if Pat's looking down on him, well, he would be very proud of him. Yes. And obviously you must love going to the awards because, you know, he's your son and he's one of you. He pays for me to go down oh, there. Oh, and so he should. <laughs> so that's a help. Oh, excellent. <laughs> You've raised a good one. You've did, raised a good one. I did one. do well, didn't you I? You did all right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm spending time with architect Michael O'Sullivan, and loving his car, by the way. And we're still in his local neighbourhood of Mangere in Auckland. 
Well, where have you brought me, young man? So this is what I refer to as a community feasting hall, pretty much. A facility that is open to the community, but run by the Free Wesleyan Church of Tonga. Known as the Lei Sili Auditorium, the huge space was built next to the church to accommodate large community gatherings and celebrations. That roof's real cool, eh? Like, I haven't seen a roof that goes like that. Yeah. So is that your bit of ingenious? Yeah. It's a very economical way to pull a big chunk of light into a building, and it's a portico. Pretty cool. Should we go in? Indeed, let's have a look. I understand the Free Wesleyan Church is the largest Christian denomination in Tonga, and the Reverend here, Frederick Fecky. Frederick, how are you? Worked closely with Michael throughout the design process. Oh, it's an impressive building. Yeah, it is, it is, isn't it? It's, um, it's voluminous. What really strikes you when you first enter is the ceiling. It's a work of art. What we see above us is a whole series of Ortex acoustic panels, and it's meant to represent uh, a blanket of frangipani. The panels help control the sound in this vast space, and I imagine help create a feeling of belonging and unity. And I like the colour, you know, that light blue. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice. When it was opened in 2016 by the King of Tonga, the place was filled to capacity and it's been booked for all kinds of festivities every weekend since then. You're lucky to be here when they're setting up for a wedding and you can see it, you know. Yeah. We'll this happens every week, exactly. you know. And, uh... We should have just waited for the food. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm getting a bit <laughs> Back when the project began, architects from several top companies were interviewed for the job. We chose Michael not only on his professionalism, but we also chose him one of the major factories because he's a local, right. he's a local person. He has a lot of friends in the Tongan community. I think that made it easier for him to relate to us yeah. because he knew the culture before we even met him. What was he like to work with? He's a down-to-earth person that you can easily communicate with, um, which, which, which is a, a, a good virtue. Choosing Michael clearly worked out well because the building has been fully embraced by the community and has won many design awards. To be invited to, you know, work on a Tongan building when you're not Tongan is privileged. Yes. It's a bit of an honour. Yeah. Obviously, the building's a great success. How does that make you feel? Oh, it's, um, it's a magnificent feeling. Every weekend we drive past it, it's full to the brim. It's a building intended to pull people together and that's a great thing. The more I learn about Michael, the more I'm intrigued by him. He's a top architect who designs buildings like this. He's been a successful wrestler and he cooks a mean roast. But someone who knows him really well is Wellington School of Architecture senior lecturer, Dr. Peter Wood. Michael and Peter went through architecture school together and have been mates ever since. It's really hard to talk about Mike without falling into terrible characterizations of a, a, a slightly larger than life figure, sort of strolling the New Zealand landscape, changing how everything looks with these fabulous buildings. Um, he is, he's larger than life. Um, but he has also got an, an intense integrity about him, which is really unusual. Uh, as, a, as a person, as a human being, and as an architect, and you, you, you don't meet that every day. In a world where everything's regulated and, and tighter and, and more difficult, it's really hard to find a figure we might see as a slight renegade in the industry. Uh, and by renegade, I, I mean someone who is adventurous with their thinking and brave with their anticipation about what architecture might be. One building that definitely demonstrates the adventurous thinking and spirit is the Bull O'Sullivan Satellite Studio, perched high above the port of Littleton. Michael splits his time between both studios. Pick up the top and the bottom. And being the very capable chap he is, he built this place himself on the tools almost every weekend for 12 months in all sorts of weather. I can remember all the sort of neighbours walking up and walking past asking me, what are you doing? You're mad. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Like the family home in Mangari, the interior here is finely crafted with elegant timber detailing. Outside, robust anodized aluminium clads the walls, along with timber recycled from the earthquake damaged wharves at Littleton Port. From the outset, Michael had a strong vision here. His intention was always for it to be more than just a studio. This place came to be by virtue of a romantic sort of vision to have a monastery for us to work in. There's not much difference between domesticity and sort of a worship space of any significance. And we tried to build that here. A site that had a massive influence on Michael and his studio is Skellig Michael, a monastery built by monks on an island off the Irish coast that dates back to the sixth century. The whole notion that the thought process that forms the beginning of a, a building or its documentation has to be done in a space that is truly inspirational. Not dissimilar to Skellig Michael where the best Irish thinkers were sent out into this incredible landscape. They went there to be the best they could be. It's kind of what this is meant to be. And like a monastery, where monks can stay on retreat, this place has a compact living area tucked below the studio. The point of having a facility like this is that, you know, when we come down here uh, for two or three days at a time, it's, it's very much fully catered for. But you can see it's um, not generous and very monastic. <laughs> there is an outdoor dining area for overflow guests when the weather permits. And off the kitchen are what Michael describes as the sleeping cells. Three separate paired back bedrooms with a bathroom at the end perfectly aligned to the rising sun. It certainly acts as a multidisciplinary space for us. Other architects come and use it, other families come and use it. So it's, it's a pretty um, fluid space. Michael's genius in creating the space has been widely recognised, including a top architecture website, naming it one of the 10 most inspiring architect offices in the world. It's a pretty dynamic sort of environment, especially with a port close by. Mm -hmm. We see cargo ships coming in, Arctic icebreakers, cruise liners, just not something that you really have if you were in the inner city or staring at an interior of a cubicle. I guess we just take it for granted sometimes, but it's definitely something that most people don't have on a daily basis in terms of their work environment. It's a wonderful place. It's very different to where we live in Auckland. And it's a nice sort of compliment to it. So it's now become a pretty valuable part of our existence. Michael O'Sullivan is a really hands-on sort of guy. He's an architect and a builder, and someone with a keen eye for interior design. In fact, he regularly builds furniture and fittings for his clients. So it makes sense that the next house he's lined up for me to see is the work of an architect equally skilled and hands-on. It was built in Auckland in the 1920s and designed by James Chapman Taylor, who was a passionate devotee of the arts and crafts movement. This style of architecture was a reaction against mechanisation and mass production and is very distinctive even today. Morning, Sandra. Morning, Andrew. Hi, Hi Mike. How are you? The house is owned by Andrew Bull, Michael's fellow architect and business partner and fashion designer, Sandra Harden. We used to live in the, down the street yes. and walked past it every day and thought, this is the home we want. Yeah. We were lucky enough to buy it 20 years ago. Yeah. We love it very much. Yeah. Yeah. Sandra and Andrew's home is one of 84 arts and crafts style houses that Chapman Taylor designed and built all over the country during a career spanning almost 60 years. So Matthew 1928, this would have been the portico outside. Outside? Um, outside. So what Andrew's done is he's reformatted what's public and private. Originally, when they would have designed this house, it would have been a series of tight little compartments and really quite awkward spaces. So he's just freed the whole thing up. 
Here's the heart of the home, the dining room. The kitchen sits over here. Proportionally, it feels really, or it feels perfect, actually. And just looking around, I really love the art, even though it's like it's very contemporary, probably more in the 2000s as opposed to the 1920s. It really works really well. Andrew and Sandra have got this wonderful, rich layering of beautiful objects, beautiful idiosyncratic representations of their family. And, you know, that's what makes a home. A good home has a heart. Mm. It has a, has a cave, it has a sanctuary, and this is the, is the heart of the home for the Bull family. And leading off from this space is the cave. In this house, it's the lounge, which has remained almost completely unchanged since it was built in the 1920s. Yeah, now this definitely feels like a step back in time. It feels way more original. The trademarks of Chapman Taylor are uh, on full display here. You can see up there with those two primary beams and the joists running across, they're all hand ads. That was a big cue for the arts and crafts movement. Behind us, we've got the fireplace with really beautiful, long, elegant bricks. And, you know, the materiality and the textures and the colours are very much a big part of what uh, the movement was all about. I'm really loving the art again. They've carried the art through this room. I've just noticed, I'm pretty sure that's a Bill Hammond. You're onto it but I have no idea. <laughs> I know it's some sort of gramophone, but like that, that looks like if you played that, it'd blow the whole house out. It's massive. Yeah, well, this is Andrew's stereo, and he's a bit of an audiophile. I'm might too scared need... to turn it on, though. Yeah, me too. You might need some earmuffs <laughs> sitting next to that. It's quite amazing to see many intriguing features in this house, both new and old. Take a look at this, Matthew. That whole hand adds thing rolls into the stairs with the treads and the risers and yeah. stitches back up into the ceiling. So it's really on full display here and it feels beautiful, you know, makes you want to touch it. Yeah. Come on upstairs. I really like the concept Michael expresses about a house having three essential zones. We've already seen the heart and the cave here and I'm picking this space has to be the sanctuary. Ah, yes. This is a pretty impressive room, isn't it? Really expansive, lots of light. It feels like a bedroom should feel comfortable. It could be really easy to lie down here right now and just have a little camp. Yeah, I might want to ask Andrew and Sandra for that first. Oh, I probably, <laughs> uh, yeah. But I've, I've got a feeling that it probably wasn't a bedroom back in the day. No, it would probably would have been um, the parlour for the home. That's where the gentleman would have, you know, retreated to at the end of the day to smoke cigars and drink yeah. mulled wine. Yeah. But what, this is the genius of what Andrew's done, is rearranged the whole thing, so it's the master bedroom. It's got a beautiful, generous wardrobe here and an ensuite where they would have been two bedrooms as well. You know, by doing that, it's allowed this wonderfully feminine reading on what used to be a very masculine space. And that's probably where um, Sandra's beautiful sort of fabrics have snuck in and, 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 and created this, you know, a very, very different space mm. from what it was in 1928. And like the rest of the house, this room showcases the beautiful handcrafted features that are really what the arts and crafts movement is all about. Every tradesperson on the, on the project had their work expressed and celebrated. So it wasn't industrialised, it wasn't mechanised, it was a celebration of the handcraft. It's something that we don't have now. Yes. Because this desire to mass produce and uniformly house people in a way that we don't get to celebrate this anymore. Mm. No, it's a magnificent house. It's been a real privilege. It's certainly got that sort of, you know, that X factor that you look for in a place. It does. The carefully crafted human touch that defines this place is a feature that also makes Michael's own houses very special. One of those is in Littleton, not far from the Bull O'Sullivan studio. It started life as a state house, but five years ago, the owners, who were outgrowing it, approached Michael about adding on another room. They got that all right, and a whole lot more. So this is the Toto Whare, where Linda and Alistair and their children, Hallie and Fife, live. This is the state house that they started off in, 
and um, this beautiful orange is a byproduct of a lot of nostalgia. The existing weatherboards got wrecked during the earthquakes, so we've put new cladding on it and repainted it to retain the authenticity of the State House. The new extension is deliberately quite sombre by comparison with just the sunny splashes of yellow joinery. Where we're standing right now is called the Atea, the space between the front gate and the Farinoi of any marae. So that sets up the entranceway into the house. And how about this for an entrance? So every family should have one of these. It's a wall that talks about who they are, where they've been, special moments. It talks about whakapapa. It talks about marae. Where they're educated. And note the day and night photographs of Windmill Road, Pukekohe, where Alistair was raised by his great-grandparents, and the obvious reference to the orange cladding, which is nostalgically re-represented here. It's just beautiful. Off the space, the vibrant colours continue, with purple carpeted stairs leading down to the original state house, and vivid blue taking you up to the new extension. So the idea of building a new pavilion up here was to get the best out of the northern sun and then let the existing state house do what it did best, which was deal with the, you know, the private realm of the home. The thinking behind this space is that it comes and ducks down over the daybed and get the most out of the port and the, you know, the beautiful views. Michael's rich textures and materials are clearly evident here, particularly in the ceiling which is superbly crafted out of Cody, salvaged from the earthquakes. The exterior of the building is just zinc alum corrugated iron. That in turn gave us a wonderful opportunity to treat the interiors with a huge amount of freedom and playfulness and, and vibrancy. I really dig the Formica benches. They are a classic and set up the connection with the original Kiwi State House. So the the beauty of uh, having this pavilion here is that it frees itself up to this deck and when you step out onto a space like this and it's set up on the east-west axes you can see the rising sun and the setting sun into these big landscapes. But you just need to be mindful of the midsummer sun in Canterbury which can be ferocious and we did so by building this pergola structure that holds the kōrari and these shade sails. By creating this airy, open-plan pavilion, it freed up the original state house to be repurposed into a more intimate, quiet zone. So this is definitely the cave to the whole home here. And it embodies a wonderful opportunity to come and sit down, relax, watch TV, listen to music. Towards the window is the office, and there's a little day bed off that as well. And off this cave at the upper level of the old state house is the main bedroom. And that, by contrast to this space, is full of light and full of energy, and it sits into the eastern sun. On the floor below, there's another intriguing room that's for painting, thinking or accommodating extended fano. It's cleverly lined with the damaged Rimu weatherboards that once clad the old house, giving it warmth, texture and history. And coming off this is another contrasting peered back bedroom. This project was a true collaboration between Michael and the Toto Fano, who did a lot of the building themselves. Michael was hands on, he was here almost weekly. Um, he'd get on the tools, he'd, you know, be with Alistair at demolition yards um, looking at wood. In 2020, this place won the coveted Sir Ian Athfield Award for housing. For the family, a lot of that success was down to their relationship with Michael. Mike truly gets to know who you are. He was passionate about us, he was passionate about our culture. You can see that reflected in, in what we've achieved. He's amazing, to the point where he's part of our whānau, his whānau are ours and we've become good friends. Architect Michael O'Sullivan begins most projects by spending time on the land, seeking a deep understanding of each site through observation and sketching. 
we use that watercolour painting process right through the working drawing stages. It's just a beautiful way to articulate yourself and present your ideas. A lot of people think that an architect's job starts and ends in an office in front of a computer. You know, the reality is, unless you come to the land and see it at the beginning of the day, the end of the day, and in the four seasons, you're not going to get a, a strong enough architectural starting point. I mean, who wouldn't want to paint this? <laughs> it's just, it's beautiful, you know? At beautiful Orpito Bay on the Coromandel Peninsula is a house Michael's just completed. He didn't have much room to move here and that influenced his design. So the building is on a tight, narrow site and with neighbours close by, we're intended to try and protect that private realm with clever little tricks with the facade opening up but not acknowledging the neighbours and inclined walls that sort of taper and focus on water and the islands beyond. The centre of the ground floor opens out onto a covered courtyard, which contains an incredible Cody table that Michael crafted himself. In fact, he makes dining tables for most of his clients. Call it an architectural obsession, but getting the dining room table right is really important for that family. If you had spent a couple of years designing the home for them, it's the least you can do architecturally to make sure that everything is consistent. That level of care goes into every detail of Michael's buildings, including the ceilings. Here, a shifting pattern of timber boards runs right through the ground floor. You can see the amount of work and care that the carpenters have taken in mitering, overlapping, and fixing the boards. It's just extraordinary. Uh, they've done an incredible job on this. To make a clear distinction between the ground floor and the upper level, Michael created a very different look for the upstairs ceiling by designing bespoke tiles, a modern take on the old school fibrous plaster tile. What we've done is flipped them, staggered them and alternated them so that when you're standing at one end of the building, looking down to the other end of the building, it's got a, a beautiful rhythm to it, not dissimilar to a cloud. Rich layering of textures like this is a hallmark of Michael's work. He is a real artist. A home has to be a beautiful piece of art and it has to be provocative at every turn and every corner. So when there's an opportunity to choose a material or, or invent a texture, you know, have the collective sum of the parts singing the same song, you've got to consider it. At the top of the stairs on the upper level is a light-filled mezzanine. This is the centre point of the home in many respects. This is where, on a longitudinal home, we manage to punctuate through the roof with this magnificent skylight and pull light down across three levels into the area that is really the hub of the home. Coming off one end of the mezzanine is the bedroom wing, where there are ship-style bunk rooms for the kids, complete with porthole windows. The two larger guest rooms have clever gill-like windows that create privacy by directing the view away from the neighbours and out towards the sea. On the other side of the mezzanine is the main bedroom, and how's that for a view? So there's not many bedrooms in New Zealand that um, you feel like you're at the bow of a ship. Uh, this would be close to one of them. The distance between the edge of the bed and that glass line is only about 1,800 millimetres. So the intention is that you feel like you're part of the ocean and the beach. Behind the bedroom is this, you know, wonderfully hedonistic bathroom. And when I say hedonism, I mean when you get into that bath, you want to feel like you're part of the star set. And what we've done above that is put up this beautiful elongated skylight that can open up 90 degrees and in the middle of the night you could get in that bath and look at the Southern Cross. And directly above this beautiful bedroom is something you would never expect. 
So this space is a, a space that I've called the Gloriette, which is a residual space of the roof that you could use for anything, basically. And in this instance, it's for coming up and sitting in the sun. When you're blessed with the beauty of that landscape and the richness of nature that is on display, it would be remiss of us as architects not to acknowledge it with something uh, proportionally intimate and, and nurtured like this. Even though this house is typically bold and unconventional, it sits harmoniously in its natural setting. Michael has achieved a masterful balance here, something you see in his other designs too, like the recently finished Copper House at Cass Bay on Banks Peninsula. Mike will go to the site and he'll get a sense of this, this big gesture that it has to be. And then the secondary and the tertiary sophistication start to appear. But there's always something there which is about holding space against the landscape. The many different sites that you're privileged enough to work on, you've got to assess you know, the sculptural prowess of it. If the building is not sculpturally provocative, beautiful in the landscape, and attending to what the family needs, it doesn't work. So, you know, having a good understanding of topography and the land and where you are in this fantastic country is, is really important. Fantastic country, all right, and we're not done yet. I've got one last house to visit with Michael and he definitely hasn't gone for convenience with this one. We're travelling to the Chatham Islands, more than 800 kilometres from mainland New Zealand. I'm beginning to see a theme emerging with Michael and remote, windswept islands. The inhospitable monastery Skellig Michael influenced his Littleton studio. And a couple of years ago, he designed a Met Office hut on Raoul Island, which is part of the rugged volcanic Kumadex group. The Met Service send up balloons on Rao Island and it records the environmental conditions that we, we generate our weather forecasts from. But they use a very flammable gas to, to, to send these balloons up very high. And Michael's hardy stainless steel hut was designed to safely house the potentially explosive gas tanks. Mike set everything up in place and it, it all came down to a, a mad five days in which he erected it himself <laughs> on the island. So it's sort of wonderfully emblematic. I thought if, if there's one building where you want to understand Mike, it's the Met Service balloon shed on Rao Island. The trouble is you're never going to see it. Where we're going is at least a little bit more accessible than Rao. We've got as far as Chatham Island, but we're not stopping here. We're continuing on to Pitt Island, which is part of the Chatham Islands group. We find a pit. Pitt Island, that's yeah. the one. Real happy about this. We're yeah, in. I can see by the look of your face. Have a look at this piece of glory that we're flying in. You'll love it. Seriously. Like. <laughs> yep. Knees up. Ripper. Righto, hey guys, let's get going. Pitt Island, here we come. Frankly, we're a long way from anywhere and steadily getting further away. But Michael, well, he's clearly in his element. Mike often seeks out extreme landscapes. It's almost uh, religious, that sense of going out there and making a place in an extreme world. I think that's what he really enjoys, testing, not himself, but testing architecture against these landscapes. Holy moly. Ripper! <laughs> <laughs> well, that was actually quite exciting. I recommend that. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Anytime, mate. Got me here safe and sound, and what a beautiful, beautiful part of the world we're in. Pitt Island. This is the first island to see the sun in the world, so it's, it's quite a magical place. It is. Um, I'm yeah. just happy we're here. I like. <laughs> like, to be honest, 
I, I thought it was a bit of a G-up when we got to the airport. <laughs> oh, no, well, yeah. we've essentially just landed in a paddock on a remote 65 square kilometre island with only 40 or so people living here. So understandably, I'm more than a little curious to find out what Michael's brought me all this way to see. For goodness sake, he must be joking. OK. Well, I've got to ask, mate, like, I mean, it's spectacular, no doubt. The scenery is amazing. You've brought me, I don't know, 800 or 1,000 kilometres away from the mainland to what, you know, like, let's be honest, it's a, uh, <laughs> it's a red shed. It's the start of this whole understanding of um, what it is to dream, you know? Yeah. Everything in, in the world that's built starts with a dream. Yes. And this is one man's dream. It's the first building in the world to see the sun. So it's a pretty special building in that regard. I'm now starting to understand the significance of this humble cottage, which was built 160 years ago to shelter shepherds. The island is remote now, but back then it was even more isolated, and conditions here can get very wild and unforgiving. In fact, the cottage is named after a brig called Glory, which in 1829 was shipwrecked on the reef just out in the bay. So you've got to remember that in 1860, what these men would have been like. You know, they would have been uh, hardy characters. Yeah, we're pretty fortunate because I, I come in here and I go, oh, oh. Yeah. Uh, they would have come in here and gone, oh, how good is Heaven. this? Yeah. That's right. In 1860, it, it was a, a bold act of heroism to build this. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's modesty speaks volumes. Well, yeah. But what the point of coming here is just to see in such a majestic landscape, you can build anything and it yes. can be the byproduct of any dream. It probably yes. needs another dream to bring it up to the sort of level that, you know, it deserves being the first building in the world to see the sun. Honestly, I'm really fortunate Michael's passion for remote locations has brought me to an extraordinary place I never thought I would ever visit. Got to look for inspiration everywhere. Uh, and landscapes like this have inspired many beautiful writers and painters and, and thinkers. It's the potential for it to inspire you to be the best you can be. And the, the notion of the dream starting an architectural process is a beautiful one. It's just as romantic as the sort of landscape that you're standing in right now. The fact that you can wake up and remember a dream and then formulate that architecturally is what we should aspire to do. There really is something uplifting about this heroic, hardy cottage and its epic setting. And it's absolutely a fitting place to end my journey with Michael O'Sullivan. This is a really unique environment that Michael's brought me to. And it kind of speaks volumes, really, because he's a unique character. He's extremely passionate about his profession. Uh, he cares deeply about the people he works for. He cares deeply about his community. And for me, it's been a real privilege getting to know him, not to mention that he's a fantastic architect and he's designed some incredible buildings. And no doubt, he will leave a legacy on the landscape in New Zealand. And I look forward to seeing what he does in the future. I took my hat to you, Michael, I really do. Thank you. Really Honor's do. mine, man. <laughs> Travel around with you, so it's a, it's a real privilege. Thank you for making the effort. My, my, I hope you've, hope my you've learned something and enjoyed it. Oh, I sure have. Cool. Happy days. <laughs>